I think I've given away most of these slides by just talking to you verbally uh, uh, so far, but in case there's anyone I haven't had a conversation with, I'll uh, go through what I've prepared. To talk a little bit about my background personally, I came from a human neuroimaging background with like special populations, that means relatively low N, involved with like uh, uh, American Sign Language, deaf uh, uh, culture and neuroscience work related to that. But my own personal academic trajectory was wanting to be much more involved in the tools that help out uh, uh, scientists, uh, which is how I ended up at uh, uh, Data Joint, spending most of my time making those tools in the form of these open source uh, pipelines that I'll talk about. So, Data Joint, just as build like one sentence uh, summary, it uh, automates day to day pipeline operations from position, processing, analyses, and then even allows for uh, distributed access and distributed com computation. I've organized these slides in a way to just sort of upfront give you like here's the current status quo of data joint NWB interoperability. Uh, I then will sort of take you through the details that would help you understand uh, the last point, which is the, poten the potential sort of other ways you could go about integrating across these tools. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't need to tell any of you about the uh, uh, potential for uh, using NWB files as part of Dandy, as part of uh, uh, interoperability with this whole uh, with this whole uh, NWB ecosystem. Um, where Data Joint can come in is to help in the process from data acquisition to pre-processing analysis, uh, uh, providing a relational database backend. Um, to, to help with the day-to-day -day of experimental implementation. Currently, uh, uh, our U24 dissemination grant is what helps us put out these open source elements. I'll say elements, and by that I'm referring to a pipeline for a specific modality. Uh, so element array EFIS, uh, EC EFIS is our most uh, developed of these elements, and it currently, through Ben's help, uh, has a great export function that will export a session from the element into an NWB file. What I'll be working on, what I have been working on, is exporting from element uh, deep lab cut to uh, an NWB file. These elements, though, uh, function as part of a greater data joint ecosystem with tools for metadata data entry, for with tools for visualization, with a uh, Jupyter environment that we call a uh, code book that sets up all of the dependencies for you. Um, where we envision ourselves going from here is uh, increasing the tools that a user could use as part of the code book uh, uh, Jupyter environment to export their, pre their uh, processing steps into an NWB file that sort of showed the end state of their experiment, not just sort of the, the raw and pre-processed version that uh, is already housed within uh, element array EFIS. Uh, we expect that we'll also be uh, adding, I suppose that arrow should really go, uh, should really attach to the existing arrow from data acquisition to uh, data pre-processing that could just um, exclusively give a uh, NWB file during the um, import steps into just the raw format alone. Um, but really the eventual end goal would be to add a, uh, a closed loop piece that as we were talking about today could go from a published dandy set to re-importing back to the elements. Uh, I see this as, as particularly fruitful um, for the potential that you could compare across uh, different uh, um, Neuropiscal type probes. I was talking to someone today about the arrangement of the electrodes on the tip of the probe and um, how that might change your analysis in some way. Uh, if you want to see what that export function looks like, we currently have it on uh, one of the branches for element array EFIS, but there's a number of other examples of what that export process could look like across different modalities. We have this uh, showcase repo that has a number of different uh, publications and links to code if you want available. 
uh, that shows how they got from their data joint pipeline into uh, exported NWB file. But to start really on, I suppose, first principles with uh, uh, data joint, I think of the primary motivation in terms of my own uh, experiences managing uh, multimodal data. In my case, it wasn't these things, it was other kinds of data, but um, certainly in the case of any uh, graduate student postdoc today, it's, it's a lot of uh, data management and sort of understanding the different pieces of a project that, you know, you have many animals, each of which might have one or more sessions. Uh, each session would give you your behavioral data, your neural recordings, uh, you have a set of parameters associated with the pre-processing uh, that gives you the spikes. Uh, those spikes in conjunction with your behavioral, you have so many different data files and it's sort of up to the scientist to put them in this organized uh, uh, pattern conceptually. And you know, it's up to the scientist to then share that pattern of this is what your uh, experiment looks like conceptually with yes, someone else. In an ideal world, we could just sort of uh, mentally transmit the uh, uh, ways we organize our data in ways that make sense uh, uh, in our own file system to our collaborators. Uh, but the reality is that we end up sharing a lot of zip files of different data types that all sort of get put together in a box. In my case, sometimes the parameters for analysis would end up on a sticky note on the side of my monitor, and I would have to you know, final, final, final version of those parameters across different analyses. Uh, even the ideal organization when it comes to those sets of files on your uh, machine coming from the acquisition process, it's a set of folders dedicated to the different animals in uh, uh, your inventory, different subjects in the uh, experiment. Each animal might have uh, different sessions, so those become some subfolders. Each uh, animal might have multiple different recording files um, per session if you have to chop it up in some way. And then you might have multiple analysis folders as subfolders within that session. Uh, assuming the ideal sort of pre-planned folder naming scheme, you know where everything is, but it still becomes a challenge to take those slices of the data that uh, selects for specific animals, that selects for specific sessions, that excludes sessions that don't fit a general criteria. Um, and, and it ends up being a lot of record keeping to associate the metadata of this happened in this session, this was the ambient temperature, and this were all of the uh, pieces that might someday uh, inform whether or not this session gets included in the eventual analysis, uh, uh, let alone when sort of pieces fall by the wayside because of you know, incomplete record keeping. Uh, to make that a multimodal process is to you know, potentially have a whole separate set of organizations. So I've been working on Element Deep Lab Cut, as I said, and uh, that is often a whole separate project directory that might be um, you know, someplace uh, separate from where you're keeping your neural pixels recording. Uh, meaning that uh, in the event that, you know, your parameters change, you decide to, you want to analyze in a different way, your data integrity is up to you to uh, have all of the, uh, to keep all of those records and uh, revise, you know, the subfolder name or, um, uh, delete, in some cases, the version that you no longer want to use. Uh, to put that in a table that I'll come back to in a little bit, uh, in the event that you're trying to select based on a specific criteria, it's up to you to manually, manually comb through your subdirectories associated with uh, uh, whatever that criteria is. In the event that you decide you want to um, start a new analysis, a new analysis based on a new set of parameters, you then have to sort of manually comb through old results, decide which are relevant, which are worth keeping, which should be um, deleted or at least archived. Uh, um, the nature of distributed computation in this process uh, often takes the shape of sharing data and communicating with collaborators. Okay, I will analyze this set of subjects. You can take over the other set of subjects and um, it becomes a 
different conversation that has to be had, has to be pre-planned, uh, separate from the process of just analyzing the data and deciding what that's going to look like. Uh, the tracking of relationships involves careful documentation in those sort of master spreadsheets that are dedicated to a specific project, and that can be huge, especially for a lab where you might want to aggregate your data sets across multiple projects. Um, as I said, data sharing can be via zip files, it can be via archives. We can have these, um, the, we can have uh, uh, great tools that help us share those data sets, but it's still the passing of files from one place to the next rather than sort of a centralized access point. Um, so comparing my previous exper uh, experience with navigating those file structures to uh, the potential to use data joint pipelines and my experience with uh, uh, helping people get set up with these pipelines, it really feels like it maps much better on to how I conceive of the experiment, where you have a set of animals. Those set of animals are just associated with a set of sessions uh, without having to you know, explicitly um, uh, uh, keep up you know, some central spreadsheet uh, dedicated to those sessions. In the case of data joint and other relational database models, if you decide a specific subject isn't worth keeping, um, that is a delete that uh, cascades down throughout your other uh, tables to enforce this um, data integrity. So uh, if, if you know, it'll never, it would never then be the case that you analyze a file and realize, oh, I shouldn't have analyzed it and have to reassess. It's not strictly uh, linear either, so I can have this set of, I can have this table associated with each of my recording sessions. I can have a separate table associated with my analysis parameters. We can imagine that this uh, second table has one row per set of analysis parameters, and then the way we've constructed a lot of these elements is to have a staging table. So um, these tables will often name them something like uh, processing task, where we associate the uh, session ID and therefore recording uh, information file somewhere on disk with the set of analysis parameters. And that table has baked into it, or the subsequent table has baked into it, the steps that it would take to populate itself. Um, so in, in this sort of imaginary, very simplified case, we have animal ID and session date that uniquely are associated with a recording file, and then uh, parameters that are associated with you know, each of the specifics of this analysis. And then this uh, final table, just by running a, um, in our case, it's, uh, we call them make functions, it's a populate command we would automatically generate the contents of this table from this upstream tasks table. By centralizing the data into a uh, backend, uh, in this case uh, MySQL backend, you would automatically gain the benefits of uh, sort of simultaneous access. Um, so data joint has uh, MATLAB, as well as Python versions, you and a collaborator could simultaneously access the same uh, database from different locations and be running the computation from that upstream task table to populate uh, these downstream tables uh, uh, just by running the same command from dis different places. Data joint itself keeps track of you know who's running what and uh, by reserving a these computations on a job list, such that if one fails, you can have a record of that. Uh, if, if someone is in the process of running the populate command somewhere else, you won't you know, try to reprocess the same file. I uh, can certainly recall instances where I analyzed something and a collaborator analyzed something, and then, oh well, we lost a day of computation. Um, Yeah, so by centralizing your database, it, uh, uh, you can just sort of expose that database, give someone credentials, and get data sharing as well as this uh, distributed compu computing function. Returning to that uh, table to really contrast across uh, 
managing files within a broader file system versus this pipeline process to select based on criteria. Uh, in the case of data joint, it's a fetch command. So uh, instead of manually combing through directories, you would take the union of uh, whatever tables you were, were interested in and then restrict that based on some specific condition. To uh, decide that you know your previous analysis is something you don't expect to publish, if you delete the parameters associated with that analysis, you'll have a set of cascading deletions across your entire pipeline such that those results aren't preserved. Uh, you can certainly still keep them and declare a new set of parameters, but, uh, uh, and then it, it'll be the case that whenever you're looking at those results, you can fetch the parameters that they're associated with and make sure that it's the final, final, final version. Um, and of course, uh, as I just talked about, there's uh, this nature of distributed computation where instead of having to uh, agree with your collaborators who is going to handle which subjects or which files from which subjects, uh, simply by accessing the same database in uh, centralized on a centralized server, you can distribute the computation uh, by just running the same command at the same time. By linking these tables to one another, uh, you naturally maintain the relationships between the downstream tables uh, uh, via you know, the subject, unique subject identifier, unique um, session identifier upstream. So in terms of where this would fit in the broader uh, research uh, process, as part of experimental design, we can factor in uh, pipeline design as uh, sort of a parallel to this is how I plan to uh, set up my experiment, this is how I plan to run data collection, and then data collection and pre-processing can, you know, with uh, uh, the right make functions, with the right um, pre-populating steps associated with each of these tables, um, you get uh, processing and analysis baked into just simply using the pipeline. We tend to think of, uh, well, I won't, speak for everyone, but uh, uh, this, this FAIR process, the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable process as sort of the end state of research, at least in my experience when I've sort of finished the experiment and then turned around to want to share it with everyone, things are organized in sort of the way that made sense to me, but to truly make them accessible to the rest of the world, we have to convert them into a way that is uh, uh, communally accessible. And so I think we can reframe the notion of uh, FAIR data as being a part of the research process or research um, experimental design process from the get-go to keep things organized in a way that is going to be accessible to everyone on the back end. Um, our elements are designed to be the tools that can be, or the puzzle pieces that fit together to build the pipeline for your experiment. Um, and, and, you know, we, by taking element animal and element session, you get the uh, metadata uh, uh, management and then specific modalities, element deep lab cut, element array EFAS, you get the specific, um, you get the data pre-processing and data management of that modality. So to go more in detail on the uh, element array EFIS and the current state of that element, I think it helps to explain a little bit um, the structure of that element, the structure of the diagrams that we associate with each of the elements. So uh, part of uh, uh, data joint core is an ability to generate a diagram. Um, this is sort of a small slice of what that would look like. Uh, uh, and it has the benefit of sort of conceptually mapping on to the way you would conceive of this experiment where you have your subject, your session, and uh, your probe insertion, your EFIS recording inherits from both your uh, session information and information about the probe. Uh, when I say pipeline, when I say workflow, those are a little bit interchangeable and they reference the complete set of tables and processing methods associated with um, this, this project. A schema refers to sort of conceptually related subsets of those tables, and by convention we use the uh, prefix. So uh, element 
animal has the uh, subject prefix, element session has the session prefix, if is probe, uh, uh, and so on. Adding to that, these colors give you information about what uh, the, the uh, different tables within the pipeline are doing. So green, by convention, is manual entry. It's where you would usually manually interact with these tables, add sessions individually, uh, whereas blue and red uh, tables are the kind that can auto-populate and sort of look upstream from themselves in order to generate their content automatically. Uh, attached to EFIS recording as part of element array EFIS is this uh, LFP table um, for local field potentials. When we put a thicker line to connect one table to the next, that indicates a one-to-one -one relationship uh, versus these dotted lines reference a relationship that's not based on the uh, unique identifiers. So the uh, unique identifiers within the EFIS probe insertion table also called the primary keys, um, somewhere within that table that is not within the unique identifiers is information about the probe and probe type. Uh, these white boxes here refer to part tables, so those offer sort of many-to-one re uh, relationships with the tables above them. You might have many EFIS recording files associated with the same recording session. Uh, another big component of the pipeline is this uh, clustering task. Recently, we added the functionality of uh, launching Killasort from the element array EFIS. Uh, uh, and so by setting a set of clustering tasks, you can generate the spike rasters, the mean waveforms from um, those downstream computed tables. So with Ben's help, we were able to take all of these tables and map them on to NWB objects and offer an export function. This is a sort of very broad diagram of what that looks like for each of the individual tables within element, element array EFIS to be associated with pieces of the uh, NWB file object. And then um, the command to generate that file uh, takes the shape of um, uniquely identifying a session, so in the form of a session key, that's this dictionary up here, uh, and then calling the function associated with that, uh, um, calling the function to generate the NWB file with that session key. These uh, pieces of metadata related to the project, related potentially to the lab and other um, pieces of metadata in uh, sort of the upstream elements, element lab, element session, element animal, uh, are optional in this export function. Um, but uh, yeah, even within the elements, you can write that file to disk and then uh, upload it to Dandy given you know, certain uh, necessary pieces of information like uh, your, your API number for your um, Dandy user. So that's where we're at now and sort of going into detail on that. If you were interested in integrating uh, Dan, D, or sorry, NWB and data joint in a different way, this isn't sort of the only way you could go about the process. It's the way we've chosen to do it for um, elements. Uh, but there certainly are alternatives. The benefits of this uh, direct export is that you can make use of an existing pipeline. So uh, there are a number of people using element array EFIS already, and by adding this export function, we give them the opportunity to export to um, NWB. Uh, the closed loop piece of the process uh, is something we hope to get, uh, uh, or sorry, expect to add um, in the future, but we're not quite there yet to make it a more um, circular relationship um, to reanalyze files. Uh, also, by exporting, you don't necessarily gain all of the features of sort of the data integrity maintenance that um, just keeping your data within the pipeline would give. The alternative is to store your NWB files directly within the pipeline itself. So this is the approach that the uh, that Lauren Frank's group at UCSF has taken, where um, so as part of defining your tables, you would define uh, uh, the fields, the data types of those fields, 
uh, you could additionally define a file path as uh, uh, the data type for uh, uh, a given attribute of a table. Uh, and so what Lauren Frank's group does in addition to managing their pre-processing in the pipeline itself, they'll uh, uh, sort of use data join as this uh, file manipulation, file maintenance piece um, and keep a lot of their, uh, uh, keeping their NWD files inside of it. It has the advantage of being relatively easy to uh, implement while still keeping everything in the pipeline as queryable and fetchable. Um, but it has sort of the disadvantage of duplicating your information. So if everything is in the pipeline as well as in the file, um, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, requiring double the space. Uh, the last option that I haven't seen implemented, um, but but uh, you know is possible, is to declare uh, custom data types within the context of your data joint pipeline, where um, that would themselves store NWB objects. Um, so declaring a custom type for a device, declaring a custom type for the acquisition for the units table, that kind of thing. Um, while possible, it would be uh, uh, difficult to implement, but it would still give, it would sort of give you the best of both worlds in terms of um, the data integrity features of data joint, uh, while also um, being able to sort of have these, uh, uh, automatically collect these pieces to the, the file that you would then, you know, share with the rest of the world and, and upload to Dandy and all those uh, uh, helpful things. Uh, yeah, so this is the data joint team. Uh, happy to answer your questions. I'm very happy to uh, tell you more about the open source uh, pieces that uh, we're putting out there. Uh, happy to help anyone implement that while I'm here. Uh, yeah, please email support at datajoint.com if you want uh, help getting started with any of the elements. Thanks. <laughs>